Uh, my name is Kevin. I'm one of the event hosts here at Powell's Books. And we be, before we begin, I want to encourage you to check out our lineup of upcoming virtual events by visiting our website at powells.com. And if you don't already do so, please follow us on the social medias, uh, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, as well as our YouTube channel. Tonight, we are so very excited to welcome Joshua Jay in conversation with Joe Posnansky. Joshua Jay's wonderful and colorful new book, How Magicians Think, Misdirection, Deception, and Why Magic Matters, brings us right into the mind of a magician, how they develop their otherworldly skills, conjure up illusions, and leave the rest of us slack-jawed with delight time after time. Along the way, Jay reveals another kind of secret, one all readers will find meaningful, even if they never aspire to perform sleight of hand. What does it take to follow your heart and achieve excellence? In 52 short, compulsively readable essays, Jay describes how he does it, whether it's through the making of illusions, the psychology behind them, or the way technology influences the world of magic. Jay, who is considered one of the world's most accomplished magicians, reveals the artistry and obsessiveness, esoteric history, and long traditions of a subject shrouded in mystery. Jay is joining us tonight from Seattle, Washington. And Jay is joined in conversation by Joe Posnansky, a longtime columnist and award-winning sports writer. He's the author of several books, including The Life and Afterlife of Harry Houdini and his fantastic new bestseller, The Baseball 100. This evening's event will include an audience Q&A. Please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen if you'd like to ask a question. And if someone has typed a question that you'd like to know the answer to, you can also upvote that particular question. And most importantly, please support Joshua and Powell's by purchasing a copy of his new book from us. A link to buy How Magicians Think, as well as a link to buy Joe's books will be shared in the chat a couple of times this evening. Joshua, Joe, we're really thrilled to have you both. Uh, Joe, I forgot to ask you where you're tuning in, uh, tuning in from. I am tuning in from Charlotte, North Carolina. All right. Well, there you go. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Uh, wow, it's great. Great to be here. Great to be with my good friend, Josh. Uh, Josh and I have been friends for a while now, ever since, because you, you would not expect uh, a sports writer to be leading this conversation, Josh. I mean, this is a I little know, bit- I know, I know, but right? I can't think of anybody better. And please, everybody in the chat, you can help me congratulate Joe, his book, The Baseball 100, which I do want to interrupt this program at some point from, from talking about magic to chat a little bit about your book, but your book just made the bestseller list and very deservedly so. I read an early galley and um, it's fantastic. So Thank I'm honored you. to have you with us and I can't think of anybody better to chat magic and life. This is going to be great. This is going to be great. Josh, uh, I met Josh when I was writing my book, uh, The Life and Afterlife of Harry Houdini. Met him very, very early in the process and, uh, and he was unbelievably kind in so many different ways, including uh trusting a sports writer to write uh, to write about houdini which is which was uh, a big concern as i got started so uh we have been friends ever since josh you know i love this book uh i've got so many questions to ask you but you know what's funny is normally for something like this i would take notes and just say okay you know just scribble down a few notes but with with your book it was so bite-sized it's so it's so perfectly I don't have to do that because I've got all 52 chapters right in front of me right. to, and every one of them has a question at the top that I could just ask you. Right. So, so this is the crazy thing for me about this book. Okay. So this is, well, what, you know what, I can explain what, what I think it is, but why don't you just, first of all, just right off the bat, super simple. What is this book? Sure. Um, well, thank you. Um, this book, if I had to say it in one sentence is my love letter to magic. Yes. So, I, I used to work cruise ships and on cruise ships, when you would perform on the ships, one of your duties was also to have dinner with the guests certain nights. So you're at a table for eight and you're one person and the people mostly had seen my show and they would ask me these questions, these core curiosities that I feel like everybody, all of us here tonight, everybody, whether you're a magician or not, you have these questions about magic. 
was Houdini as good as everybody says he was? What happens if you screw up a trick on stage? Who's your favorite magician? Like of all the magicians in the world, is David Blaine for real? All these questions. And there are these like trite answers that we magicians give like, well, I could tell you, but then I'd have to kill you. <laughs> but then there are real answers to these questions. And the real answers are fascinating. And over a period of about a decade, I learned how to answer these questions and see what fascinated people and see the things that people really wanted to know and didn't know about magic. And so eventually that's what this book became. And in terms of who it's for, it's not just for magicians, it's for anybody who right. loved magic as a kid or loves magic or is fascinated by mystery or has none of those particular qualities, but is interested in taking their craft, their passion, to the next level because i i don't know about anybody else um you and i have talked about this but i am so interested in how people who do something at a high level approach that crap yes and that can be baseball and that can be stamp collecting and that can be chess and that could be magic i'm just so interested in how people approach things and you you actually this is all your fault because <laughs> many years ago now several years ago you were just about finished with, I think it was the Houdini book, it was before the Batesville 100. And I said to you, hey, I've just sold this book that I've been trying to write and, and get out there for years. And it finally happened. And now I'm rudderless. I don't know what I'm doing. I am writing off in directions and spending weeks and then looking at what I wrote and it's not germane to the project. What advice do you have? And you, do you remember what advice you gave me? I think I do, but I'm, okay, I'm, I'm so going to screw it up. So what you said, and you said it wasn't specific to you, but you had been passed this advice. And I think this is really cool. And what I think is cool about it is it doesn't just apply to the book, but it can apply to like when I'm working on new magic pieces. You said to distill down the goal of your book to one sentence. Yes. And write that sentence down on a piece of paper and affix it, tape it to your monitor. So that you're staring at it in the face when you write every page, every paragraph, every sentence. If it doesn't serve that purpose, then it has to go. And my sentence to sort of come full circle and answer your question in the most long-winded way is this, the, the eventual post-it note that I came up with was, I want to deepen people's appreciation for magic and magicians. Yeah, That's it. I happen to believe that magic is the most beautiful lovely complicated intelligent craft in the performing arts and i think most people think it's a diversion for small kids so this book is my attempt to help people see it through the eyes of somebody who loves it and cares about it yeah well i mean first of all it does that but i think it does more than that and that was why i was so excited when you told me you were writing this book and especially as you were talking about what this book meant to you because I really truly believe you don't have to care at all about magic to love this book because it is first of all it is someone who loves their craft so much that it comes through in every single thing you do and and it's funny you should say that that you think of it as a love letter to magic because I have done many, many of these the last couple of weeks for the Baseball 100, and that's what I say, that it's my love letter to baseball. It's, it's, it's interesting. Our minds really think along those same lines. But the second thing is, I think what you do is explain ways, give people ways, and I think about this all the time, that you can bring magic into your own world, into your own life, into your own job. There are so many lessons, I think, from magic that people can use, whether they're in sales, whether they're in, in art, whether they're in, you know, whether a sports writer or any other kind of writer, uh, there's so many things. And you talk about those things in this book because you have spent a lifetime studying this craft and, and inventing from this craft. Yeah. I mean, the thing that I would say is that, you know, oftentimes people put up this like softball question in the beginning about the book because the subtitle is deception perception and why magic matters so joshua let's begin here why does magic matter <laughs> right. and the thing that i always tell them because that's not really an answerable question 
Yeah. But the thing that I always say is just what you're talking about, which is the way you think like a magician, the way you do it is to think like the audience. Yes. So magic, you can think of magic as a game of chess with the audience's intellect. And you're constantly trying to stay one or two or 10 moves ahead. And when I sit down and I have a deck of cards and I am thinking with my hands, that's sort of you know playing around with ideas and trying to make things happen. I'm constantly asking my the question of myself, what would the person on the other side of the table think if I said this? What would they think if I did this? Where would they look if I brought my hand up this way? And so that's what magic is. How you think like a magician is really thinking like our audience. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's so many different places we can go, obviously. One of my favorite chapters in this book is you say at the very start, okay, let's invent a magic trick right now. Yes. Right. And you take us through the process. And this is what's so incredible about it and 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 i know this is something that you think a lot about magic is unique as an art form in some ways in some ways it is completely unique as you talk about it, and you can explain to say this way better than i can but it's something that i saw when i was writing about magic and houdini and, and magicians is that unlike an art form where like if you're playing if you have a great pianist you follow his hands, right? Like, like the camera will come close right. on the hands and you're like, wow, look at, look at how he's moving those hands. It's beautiful, it's graceful. And in magic, if somebody is following the hands and actually sees what you're doing, then it didn't work, right? Yeah. Like, or like, you know, that's the whole thing. So it's, it's in that way, it's different. But there's so many similarities in the, in the way you have to think about it. You have to be so creative and, and you, have to, you have to come up... I love the idea that what love for you. Maybe this is the best place for you to start. You start a magic trick at the, at the end, right? Like, like if the way you were explaining the magic that you were like, okay, let's start a trick. I want to make blank happen. I want to make this. I want to be able to have a pen floating in front of your eyes. Right. Or I want to be able to do whatever. That's where you start with the finish with the finished product is the first thing in your mind. And then it's like, okay, how do I get there? Yeah, I mean, so so we use, I'll give you some magic jargon in case this is interesting to anybody, but I, I think about this a lot and I think it's fascinating. There's method-driven creativity. So that would be like somebody, you know, a magician sitting there playing with a deck of cards and they realize, hey, if I cut these cards, that does a certain property. How can I exploit that for a magic trick? And that's method-driven. Or, hey, I've got this weird move and when I go like this, it shoots a coin in the air. But most of the tricks created that are method driven look like they were method driven tricks. Like you see these weird, very abstract magic tricks like, hey, I produced a bowling pin followed by a banana. And it's like, great, why a bowling why? pin, why a banana? <laughs> well, because they have properties or something about it you can produce. But effect driven magic, effect is what we call the theme of the trick, like what happens in the trick. And effect theme magic is really dreaming. You sit around and you go, what would be an amazing trick? And that's in, it's also my favorite chapter in the book, or at least top two or three. It was really fun to write because I sort of start the chapter out by going, okay, we're going to create a magic trick right now. Right now. And I take you through the steps of how one might go about creating a trick. It's so cool. It's so interesting. And you know, the other thing about it, now I'm going to start getting into some specifics on the book, but I, I do want you to talk about this because I've been around you enough now, we've been friends for long enough now that I know there is not anything in your life that happens that cannot inspire you to something magical. Like, the, like literally you will be in a restaurant and you'll see the, the, the wrapping that they have and you're like, oh, I wonder if I could use that. Like, like every single thing for you like comes back to, is there anything I can do with that? Yes. Uh, and that's both a blessing and a curse, right? <laughs> I mean, the poetic way to say it, I guess, would be that magic is the lens through which I, I see the world. And that's not just pretty patter for a magician. That is true. But it's also really hard to turn that off. Yeah. Um, it's hard to unplug because I am constantly, you know, I took a beautiful train ride today from Portland to Seattle. 
And all I could do was think about the show that I did last night and think about other things and play with things and, and write in my notebook. And it's like, man, just enjoy the foliage and, <laughs> and relax, but, but it's difficult. And, and those life events and things that happen and those stories often become the best tricks. So for example, I, I wanted to make it clear to, to everybody kind enough to tune in and watch tonight that this unfortunately is not a magic show. I'm, I'm more here to, to talk about the book and what's great about it. And you can, I hope, come see me perform when I come through your area or, or when you're in New York and you see my show. But I wanna show you uh, one or two things if, if we get the time. And this feels about right because this is something true that happens. So I don't know if the powers that be that are doing this can um, pin me or, or make me big in the things so that you can see me. You'll let me know. Hope you can see this a little bit too. So Joe, did you notice this ring I'm wearing? I did notice that. Yeah, it's, I think it's really cool. This is a special stone that's found only in Bahrain, the country of Bahrain. And I went to Bahrain to perform and I was given this ring and it was a really interesting gift. It's actually inscribed. I'm positive the camera probably won't pick it up but it's inscribed with the date that I performed there which was the date of the show and it was the first show by uh, an American in the country of Bahrain a first magic show and I went to do this trick with coins that I love to do for people and I realized that you can't wear a ring when you perform because people think it's part of the trick that it's it's part of the magic but when they gave me this gift, they said, this actually isn't a gift. This is an invitation to come back because rings are circular. So we hope by accepting this ring that you will come back and see us again and bring this special stone back to its homeland. So I thought that was really beautiful. And I always take this off when I perform. I'll place it here in this coin purse so that you can watch it the whole time. And that way you don't think anything is touching it when we do this. So let me tell you exactly what's going to happen before it happens. Each of these three coins, these are silver dollars, American silver dollars. Each one of these is going to disappear. First one. That's the first one. This will be the second one, watch. Second one gone. Looks cool, right? Last one. This is the one you got to watch. But there's always a surprise in a magic trick. And the surprise in this one is that we've come full circle back where we started. And if the ring is here, then over here, Michael Jackson, <laughs> over here where the ring is supposed to be, are now all three coins. So great. Thank you. So great. So great. I'm sure people are applauding. Uh, yeah, they're, they're, they're throwing in too cool into the uh, chat. It's awesome. It's something just occurred to me, though, because listen, everything that you just said is true, right? The ring that you got, everything is just, yeah, it's all 100%. true. Start. Everything is true. So my question for you is this. Here's a weird one for you. Um, in my life, I write, obviously, a lot about sports, but I also write a lot about my family. I write a lot about people around me. And there are times that something will happen. I will be with my daughters or I will be with a friend and something will happen and they will turn to me in the middle of something goofy happening and saying, Oh, you're going to write about this, aren't you? Like, you're going to, you're going to, you're going to totally write about this. And I'm like, oh yeah, sure. Of course I am. And um, you probably have people in your life going, oh, you're just going to turn this into a magic trick, aren't you? You probably have that happen. Yeah. And I mean, it does. And people sometimes are like, you can't talk about this. You know, I did. So, so one of the closers of my show is the true story of how my mom met my dad. And you know, I joke in, in the show that, hey, this was my bedtime story till I was like 14. 
<laughs> but it is true. And it's one of these Benjamin Button style stories where she's going out with friends, but the taxi driver's late because he stopped for a coffee. And my dad was eating alone in a restaurant and the parking lot was crowded. So he was put behind and the, they slammed on the brakes in the taxi cab and coffee goes everywhere and all over her dress. And she goes in to fix it into this restaurant by chance as he's walking out and they actually physically collide. And that's how they met. And that's how they spent their life together. And that's why I'm here. This origin story of me has to do as much with the coffee being too hot and a parking lot being full as anything else. And, and that story felt completely aligned with the trick that I wanted to create, which was to say to somebody in the audience, shuffle up this red deck of cards, I'll shuffle up this blue deck of cards. And then we shuffle up the decks and then we start dealing the cards out and every card in the deck matches. So it's the same thing. It's the story of everything falling into place exactly perfectly. And ever since then, my mom is always like, don't turn this into a trick, please. <laughs> She's very private. She gets real shy every time I tell the story. So, um, but yeah, I mean, real life, real life is the ultimate inspiration. Now there are many magicians and, and we should have made this clear at the outset. You know, we were talking about inventing tricks. There are many magicians who never invent a trick in their life. They perform tricks created by other magicians or they do the classics. And there are magicians who don't use magic as storytelling. But I did that little coin thing, even though that's just a, a two minute piece because it is true. And I, I want my magic and I, I want the magic that I share with people to have a narrative quality. And as an audience full of, of readers for, for the wonderful Powell's, bookstore, which I love coming to. I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person. It's, it's perhaps um, interesting or applicable to you guys because I am trying to tell stories yeah. with my chosen craft, which just happens to be magic. But it's still, at its core, magic is storytelling. There's always a beginning, a middle, and an end. There's conflict. And if the trick works right, resolution. And um, there's so many sort of qualities that are both part of storytelling and also good magic. It's interesting because you are, I mean, everybody, all the, the best magicians, the very, very best magicians are storytellers in a way, but very few, I think, are storytellers like you are. In that I think a lot of times the magic of some of the greatest magicians in the world. I mean, I'm talking about people who are, you know, who you and I have talked about who are right. mind-blowingly good at what they do. It's still at the end, you're amazed and you're wowed, but you're like, okay, but why? Like, why did they tell, why did they do that? Like, mm -hmm. okay, yes, they, 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 they made my card appear on the ceiling or whatever the case may be, but I didn't ask them to make the card appear on the ceiling, right? Like, I mean, like it was, it's astonishing to watch, but there's no larger like point to the story. Your, yeah. your magic always does though. Your magic, like that's super important to you. Yeah. You don't do a magic trick for just no reason. Like ever, try, I've never seen you do that. Right. I mean, I try not to, of course. And that's a very nice thing to say. I mean, that's, it means a lot when you have very strange artistic uh, standards for yourself and people notice that, you know, sure. but you're right. I mean, one of the problems with magic, one of the inherent problems with magic is it is essentially always trivial, right? I mean, if I hold up two rubber bands and I make one rubber band go through the other, it can be amazing. It can be yes. totally impossible, but it is totally trivial. Why would two rubber bands penetrating each other matter. If I take a pen and make it disappear, why would that matter? And in magic, we have all these wonderful theories. And one of these wonderful theories that, that came about is the ham sandwich theory. And the theory of the ham sandwich is that if I reached through this screen right now and reached up to, to Joe's ear and pulled out a ham sandwich, Joe would go, oh, wow, I have no idea how you did that. But it's pretty random. <laughs> it makes no sense. Why a ham sandwich? But if you said to me, Joe, boy, um, I'm going to keep doing this interview here with you because we, we signed up to do it, but I'm starving right now. And I said, oh, really? Let's go with that. What would you want to eat if you could have anything? And you said, you know, I could really go for a ham sandwich. And if I, at that point, reached up and plucked it out of the air and gave it to you, I'm fulfilling a need. 
So fulfilling a need is a big thing in a magic show is making it, justifying it by making it make sense. Another way to do that, and the great Harry Houdini, who you spent years chasing around for your fantastic biography on him, Harry Houdini figured out that the way to make his tricks relevant was to make them dangerous. Yes. He determined that pulling flowers out of the air, he was known as the king of cards briefly uh, early in his career. It was in an era in vaudeville where everybody was specializing, but it all seemed so trivial. But he realized that if he could risk his life, that people would come not to see Houdini do magic, but to see Houdini survive. And so we all, I think all of us who care about magic deeply, we're all in search of ways to make it non-trivial. And this is mine to tell, to tell stories. It's, it's, it is such a fascinating part, I think, of magic. It's not that well known that when Houdini first started uh, getting out of straitjackets, uh, you know this, of course, uh, it didn't work. Nobody got it. Right. Well, why? Why is he going into the straitjacket? And then why is he getting out? And what is a straitjacket? I've never seen a straitjacket. Like none of this makes any sense to me at all. And then later, only later, did he realize that it needed to have a story. The story, I found this in this, in this mental institution. This is where they put the most dangerous people. And then it needed to have like a whole a whole performance. He had to like make it seem like it was impossible and he was squiggling around and fighting. And then of course, later he's doing it while upside down and that's why it worked. But, but it is, but I think you do it also. And I think that this comes through in this book. So let me, let me say something about the book, first of all. So this book is, is separated into 52 chapters, each of them questions. And what I love is the very first chapter is why magic right? Like right away, we're just starting off with why magic. And the very last chapter is also why magic. But the second last chapter is, uh, is there real magic in the universe? And this is what this book crosses, in my view, it crosses from, okay, let's start off very slowly, right? It's like you're building, it's, it's a, it's a, it's yeah. musical, right? You're building the crescendo, you're building okay, why magic? What is it? Is it real? What are you doing? Do you care if people find out your secrets? Uh, how important is that? Let's talk about Houdini. Let's talk about this. And you move slowly, slowly, slowly. And then you come all the way to, is there real magic? Like this is like the, the very essence of what really people want to know. Yeah. You know, I'm, I think that we said, I said in the, the introduction, the proverbial, you know, feel free to skip around to what interests you. But as an author, I die inside a little bit when I say yes. that, because of course there is a method to the madness. And if you read it in order, it builds and you're, you're building on what you've learned and, and I'm taking you deeper and deeper in the craft. The chapter that you mentioned was very important to me. And it's a perfect segue from Harry Houdini actually, because it deals with, you know, later in life, as Houdini started to be less physical in his escapes, he asked himself the question, how can I stay relevant? How can I make them care? How can I raise the stakes? And that become attacking spiritualists and attacking pseudoscience and, and fraudulent mediums of the time, because he saw that spiritualism was in a wave across the country, gaining in popularity, and he could educate the public and thus make his appearances and his shows essential because he is sharing really helpful news so people don't get swindled out of money or talking to, to their dead mother when it's really not their dead mother. Um, here's my story of something that happened. So I was in Ecuador. I studied abroad. I studied abroad twice, once in Paris and once in Ecuador. Now, when I studied abroad in Ecuador, I was told that, oh, you're a magician. Do you know about the real magic? You have to go see the real man. I'm like, what are you talking about? Hmm. So there's this place in Ecuador on a high cliff. And you go to this place to see something that is truly, you can read about it on the internet. You can go to this place. It's inexplicable. It's supposedly one of the great mysteries of nature unsolved. And here was my experience. I go to this place at great expense and um, you, you meet in a parking lot. And these two young kids, they'd be teenagers, said, um, you, want, you want to see the magic? And I said, yeah, I want to see. So I was just me. I was by myself. And these two guys take me on this path. And they set a magic tone. It was so great. And they said, please, uh, no speaking when we walk this path. And you walk through the woods a little bit and you get to the cliff that overlooks the ocean. It's stunningly beautiful. 
and you walk in silence following these two kids. I have no idea where I'm going. And you get to a high point on the cliff and they say, kneel down, I kneel down. And he takes out a flute and he starts playing the flute. And then he points out into the ocean. And as he plays this flute, sea turtles float up to the top, right on cue with the music and stick their head up and stare right up at us. And I'm looking down very far. And then another one, and then a third one. And before you know it, there's 12 sea turtles floating up, listening to this song that he plays on the flute. And I'm, I mean, it's, it's like a religious awakening. It's an amazing experience to see magic that fools a magician and that, that I can't explain. I mean, my rational mind takes over and it's like, I don't think they can hear the music. They're underwater and it must be four or five stories and, and they're kids and how do they know what's going? They can't train sea turtles. It's the open sea, what's happening here. And as we walk back, I'm asking them questions and in their broken English, they're, they're telling me that this is an ancient song passed down by their people. And this song is the turtle song. And it's just, it's just a really moving moment. And I stay in the parking lot and I'm like shook up because I was very into magic already by this time. And I see other people coming and, and they come back crying and, and they, they huddle around a car and they're praying. And, and I wish that was where the story ended because then I would have this feeling of real magic. But of course, what separates a magician from everybody else is we want to know. We want to know the secret. So I sneak back from the back way on the path so that I can kind of meet, if they're coming down this way on the top of this hill, I come back this way and I'm just sort of crouched behind some bushes. And I look out into the ocean and I see these turtles coming up. And I realize they're coming up and down. For 15 minutes I watch, they're constantly coming up and down and up and down. They're breathing. They're just coming up to the top because this is what turtles do in this area. It's just beneath them, wherever they live and nest. And I realized that it's just a classic example of misdirection. They're playing the flute, but they don't say in a minute, some turtles are gonna come up and it's really amazing because I would see turtles are already coming up, but they play the flute and then they call attention to the turtles and you understand this is at its core, a well choreographed magic trick. Yeah. And so the answer is there is no real magic in the magician's magic wand top hat sense. There's no real magic in the universe, but there's so much great illusion that it's so incredible to see it and appreciate it and to learn the artistry behind it. You know, one of the themes of this book and one of the themes that, that I know you think a lot about relates directly to that story, which is, would you ever tell anybody? Like if they were yeah. walking back crying and though I wonder how they did it, how they did it, would you ever tell them how they did it? And I don't think you would. I certainly wouldn't if it was my show, because I think that would be taking something from them. Yeah. The, the line that is the difficult one to discern if you're a magician is we say we're magicians. So when we do magic, there's an implicit understanding that you're going to be deceived and I'm going to deceive you to make you happy. But what would really bother me is if somebody saw that song and that turtle awakening and they took that as a sign that God is watching over them right, right now and they need, right. you know, it gets very heavy, very fast. And I, as much as I love to deceive people for entertainment, I think the worst thing in the world is people who use deceptive practices to actually swindle people or take advantage. So it's hard. You know, I wrote about Yuri Geller in my book and I, I, I've had great experiences with Yuri Geller as a person. I've shared the stage with him. But there is, you know, he blurbed my book. How, how many authors do you know that insult the people who blurb their book? But Yuri Geller, unfortunately, has taken great advantage of a lot of people. And there's no way to sidestep that issue or treat it delicately. It's not fair. And to claim that you have real powers when you don't is, um, is really problematic. Yeah, yeah. All right. If you have some questions, we'd love to, uh, Josh would love to answer them. I'd love well, to ask him. 
while you're um, formulating those questions, I want to uh, switch gears and do a little departure for just um, five minutes or so. And I want to talk to you about your book. Oh, Joe, wow. There we go. Tell us about the response of the Baseball 100. Well, it's been remarkable. Uh, absolutely mind-blowing. So the Baseball 100 is a countdown of the 100 greatest baseball players ever, which, you know, I mean, you and I have discussed this, that the the Venn diagram of people who love magic and love baseball, it's like it's like you and me. Like, we're right. the only ones, like, in the middle. Yes. Uh, it's a pretty small group. It's, it's bigger, actually. I've said that. I've used that line before. And then I've had numerous people say, no, no, that's not true. I love, I love magic and I love baseball. So, I mean, I'm sure there are some, um, but the, the baseball 100 is, a, is, is a ranking of the hundred greatest players ever, but it's not, I mean, it is, that is absolutely what it is. Uh, you, and I count them down from 100 all the way to one, but it is sort of exactly what you've said. It's my love letter to baseball. It is every, Thing about why I love the game. It is everything about why I think baseball is so special. And, and it is, um, and it is 900 pages long. Yes. It is, it is a very, I go deep into this and, uh, and, you know, when you write a 900 page baseball book, you don't really expect it to, to be a particularly big seller. You, you know, you write it for love well, and did. you write it but you did, which is which is really interesting. I you knew it would be, be. I knew it would be a big hit, and I am so glad that it is. So listen, I, I have a couple things that I remember. I read this months ago, that I remembered that I wanted to ask you, and and I don't want anybody else. We're friends, so we can rib each other. I don't want anybody else to mistake me asking <laughs> tough questions um, as as any kind of disrespect. I know, I know less than can fit on the pin ahead of a pin about baseball compared to Joe. But I have two things. And one is, I think I was surprised how high you, I, I don't want to spot, spoil the top 10. I know you keep that pretty tight, but, well, but it's no secret that Barry Bonds is in the top 10. And I was surprised you ranked him so high and I yes. can't be the only one. No, and you are not. I guess that like, you know, you get to make up your own criteria for when you do this. But to me, your, your criteria for putting him so high is what we often hear, which for why you should be in the hall of fame which by the way, I turned 40 in two weeks and I, my girlfriend and I are going to the uh, Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown, thanks to Joe. Uh, so I got a great tour, so I'm excited. Um, the rationale everybody uses is, well, before he, take, he started taking PEDs, he was already one of the greatest players of all time. He was the complete baseball player. And so even if you take those things out, he's still so great that he deserves to be ranked high. You add in what he accomplished when he was cheating and it's, it, it puts him over the top. But to me, the part where you cheat isn't just like, well, we can choose to ignore it or we can put it in. It's like he cheated. He goes down many, 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 many steps because of what he did to the game. You disagree clearly. Well, I don't necessarily disagree with what you're saying, I, but but I, what I would say is that there's a lot of context you have to put in there. I'm, I'm sure this is not something that everybody would be thrilled to uh, to hear about right now. But um, you know, lots of people were cheating. The game was not did not the game itself was broken. There was no testing for for steroids. Uh, many many players were using it. There was absolutely no reason not to, other than your own conscience. The game itself did not, not only did not uh, uh, clamp down on it, but I think tacitly encouraged it. I mean, to 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 hit more home runs meant to make more money, and to make more money meant to you know be a bigger star. And and uh, and you know the the story with Barry Bonds goes that he was clean until 1998 when uh, uh, two players, Mary, Mark McGuire and, and uh, Sammy Sosa, went on a very big home run. Uh, they both broke, broke the home run record and, and America was, was, was uh, utterly uh, at a standstill for it. And he was, he said, well, wait a minute, you know, if the, he knew those guys were using steroids and he was like, if those guys are using steroids and doing that, wait till you see what I could do on steroids. And he wasn't wrong. Once he took steroids, he was so good. He literally broke the game. So, <laughs> okay. so yeah, I think, I think you can, you can, um, uh, there are a lot of arguments I think to be made whether or not he belongs in the hall of fame. And I think those are a lot of the arguments, what you're making the baseball 100 is not the hall of fame. It is the, right. it is the greatest players. 
And in my mind, there is no question that Barry Bonds is one of the greatest players who ever lived uh, before he used steroids and after he used steroids. And, uh, and uh, so I rank them, but, but you are hardly alone in, uh, in uh, not being super happy with where he's ranked. Yeah. This leads me to my next question, and then I'll have a quick fire last question, and we'll we'll get back to some of their questions about magic. Um, I love making lists. I love listing greatest directors, greatest magicians. I mean, it's just a fun thing to do. So, I mean, I, there's just a great it's a, it's such a page turning vehicle for your book because I constantly want to see who's coming up next. Sure. Does in your own imagined criteria for for the book does integrity and personality play a role because you you know you go on and on about the players you love to interview during when you were covering the game sort of on the ground and you know I loved reading about Cal Ripken Jr. who I grew up watching and he's just such a great guy and sure and and he I assume he gets to rank a little higher not just because what he achieved but how great he is for baseball does personality play a role or were you truly asking yourselves who are the best players no, personality definitely plays a role. Leadership plays a role. Uh, ability to rise to the occasion. I think all of the same things. I mean, I know that it's that I'm stretching here, but there are many things that I see in magic that I see in baseball. And I think a lot of the things that make a great magician also make a great baseball player. And 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 you would not think of it that way. But but to me, there is no question that Cal Ripken, as just an example, since you mentioned him. Uh, him playing every single day, setting the record for, for the longest streak, him being such a, you know, such a leader, uh, you know, being the guy that, that was always, you know, there to, to take the team on his shoulder, whether the team was winning or losing. Yeah, of course it plays a huge role in, in this, but I also don't think you can be a great baseball player in sort of isolation. I mean, I think you, it's so much of it is, about um, you know being uh, you know being a leader and being a great teammate and being all of those other so, things. So, given that answer, my last question is: Why did you rank Barry Bonds? So, no, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> my last question is about Pete Rose. Um, okay, I I I identified with that chapter because I really liked Pete Rose as a player growing up. Sure, sure. and was pretty young when the scandal occurred, and. Um, the, you know, again, we're stretching because we're linking it back to magic, but the qualities that you mentioned about Pete Rose in a positive way, I really relate to as a magician because yeah. so much of my life, you know, I'm not a famous magician. I'm not David Copperfield performing in a, in a Vegas showroom every night. And so much of my life is trying to be great every night. You know, four nights ago, I was in an IHOP lecturing to magicians. Then the next night I was in a huge auditorium with 800 people. And then I'm in uh where was it the minneapolis at the the book festival with thousands of people and then i was with 40 people last night i mean it's ups and downs and somebody who goes out and grinds it out and gives it 110 percent every day really is endearing to me but pete rose's you paint such a complicated figure because he doesn't seem that remorseful and what he actually did was so much worse than what he was actually accused of in the day so weigh in on Pete Rose, where you land, should he be in Cooperstown? Why'd you put him in your book? What's he like as a person? Well, he's one of the greatest players ever. So that's why he's in my book. I, I do believe he should be in the Hall of Fame uh, with, uh, with it on his plaque saying that he was suspended for life for, for gambling on the game. I just, you put that on his plaque. It's a part of the history of the game. It's a part of, of his life. He is a fascinating character. And, and I think this is a great way to bring it all the way back around to magic. You and I are both utterly fascinated by and obsessed with people who perform at their very best every single night. Okay. Now in baseball, that's a guy like Cal Ripken or Pete Rose or, or Derek, you know, Jeter. There are, there are Jeter, plenty of players you can talk about today who are like that. In music, it's it's Bruce Springsteen or or you know, I think about Bruce Springsteen, you know, you and I have talked about this that how many different times have Bruce Springsteen sung uh, a Born to Run? I mean, right. how many times? And yet every single night you you feel like he's doing it for the first time just for you because, because that's so important to him. And I think magic in, in some ways is the hardest of them all because 
once you know a little bit about magic and I know very little, but I know a little bit, you do understand that there are illusions that you do that in the middle of it, you could totally just cash in because it, the, the trick's already over everything that you've needed to do you've done. And, but you, but they don't know that like the audience doesn't know that. And if you don't, completely sell it from that point on completely take it to the end they don't get the experience they don't get the true experience they get sort of a a half experience and you would never do that as a magician you would never do that and most magicians who are really care about their craft would never do that and i i think that's utterly crucial i i think you're exactly right and in some ways what makes it both harder and easier is this um Musicians, actors on stage, actors on screen, there's no breaking of the fourth wall, right? They go out and they play a show at you. They are playing a show at the audience. A magician, a good magician, is doing a show with the audience. Ours is a directly confrontational performing art in the sense that the card you say, the the bill you give me, the month of the year you choose has everything to do with how the outcome is going to be. So in that sense, it keeps things fresh. But in another way, it's very hard because it is like Groundhog Day. I mean, I'm on a 36 city book tour with almost no no breaks. And how do you keep it fresh every night? It's it's a really hard question. And I'll tell this this story very briefly. I love this story. I, I, I adore this. And when I think about it every single time, it energizes me. So if any of you do any public speaking or or anything of that nature, maybe this is helpful to you. And the, it's, it's a music uh, industry sort of proverb. And it goes like this, um, they're backstage at Carnegie Hall and the conductor comes backstage to all the musicians as they're warming up and uh, in the pit and says, um, hey, we're gonna do Beethoven's Fifth tonight uh, as the opening piece. And a guy says, oh, it's so obvious, I mean, <laughs> Why, why don't you just pick the most obvious thing in the world? We've played it a million times. They've heard it a million times. Why can't you pick something obscure and wonderful? And he says, come here. He pokes the head out the curtain and he says, you see that old lady in the left corner on the aisleway? This is probably the last time she's ever going to hear Beethoven's Fifth. No, no, no. And wait a minute, wait a minute. Do you see that little girl in the front row? She can't be, what, five years old? Here with her grandparents? This is the first time she's ever going to hear Beethoven's Fifth. You're not playing this for you. You're playing it for them. Wow. Yeah. So great, right? I, because that's what this is about. And truly, that is my North Star is whenever I'm not in the mood, I'm under the weather, I'm exhausted, I didn't sleep well. I know going out there, this is the first time they're seeing me. It may be the first time they're ever seeing magic. And it may be the last time they're ever seeing magic. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, there's a baseball version of that story, which is Joe DiMaggio uh, was told, uh, uh, you know, you know, uh, you're you're beat up, you're hurt today. You know, why are you going to go out there and play? And Joe DiMaggio said, because somewhere in that stands, there's a kid who's seen their first baseball game. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, I, that's I mean, it's it's great. All right. Let's get some questions here. Yeah, let's do it. Robin wants to know, is magic not cool to cool people? Because cool people don't like to feel unguarded and vulnerable. That's a good question. Yes, yes. I mean, it, it, it opens up a whole can of worms. A great question, Robin. What I'll say is this. Performing magic up close is about managing egos. And that can be the magician's egos, but most of the time it's, it's the audience's egos. So for example, when I did restaurant magic, when I was 15 to 18 years old, I performed in three restaurants a week. Thousands of hours spent walking up to tables doing magic for tips. And when you would approach, sometimes a guy, typically a guy, would be very threatened if he's on a date, if it's not married and everything is secure, something going on. The dynamic would often be that that a man could typically get very threatened when I would show up and I'm able to do things that he can't do, which is of course ridiculous. I'm there to entertain them. (laughs) And sometimes, you know, you're performing at a corporate function and and a CEO can be really almost possessive because he's used to being the big boss or she's the big boss. And all of a sudden you're on stage doing something impossible for the company. 
And magic can be about balancing egos in a very weird way. And of course, the solution that I eventually came upon is you have to empower those people. You have to confront it head on and make it known that I'm okay with you being responsible for the magic. Maybe they have something with the magic or you have to be okay with me. I'm not here to threaten you. I'm not here to take your your girlfriend or your wife or your husband. I'm here just because I'm entertaining you guys. We can all relax. Yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, people have different responses and and I've always been one. I, I was once pulled on stage um, at a uh, magic show in Hawaii of all places and with my kids in the audience and they took my watch broke it you know did the whole no. thing broke the watch and then and then gave it back to you well i knew how he did it like i i i know enough about magic even then that i knew how he did it and i saw him do it i mean i you know oh, wow so what you know what i mean like right. like at that point it was like oh my gosh unbelievable i came back to to the kid they're like oh my gosh did you see anything i'm like nope that was unbelievable What's the uh -huh. point? I mean, like, 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 we're here to have fun with this. All right, here's a good question for you. If you've seen it, and of course we both have seen it, and not only have we seen it, you are good friends with the person we're going to be talking about. How does the type of storytelling and use of magic that Derek Delgadio did in In and of Itself uh, fit in with your thoughts on stories and magic? And I know you have very strong feelings about this. Yeah. Um, well, for those who don't know, you should on Hulu now, it's no longer live, but you should see uh, in and of itself a great, I can't even call it a magic show. It's a great show that great has show. some magic in, in it. Um, but it is a story about uh, about identity and and about his upbringing and, and really traumatic things and really, really sweet things. And it's a great show. Um, generally, I think what you're asking is, is for me, magic is, is a form of storytelling where I can express myself through the things that I'm doing. And that doesn't mean every trick is a 10 minute story. Um, we'll, we'll end today with a, a little two minute thing, um, if, if we like, but, and it won't be some involved story, but I do use magic as storytelling, but I hope I do that in my own way. You know, most magicians have a character and they and they decide what that character is. I'm gonna to decide to be the uh, chef magician. I'm gonna be the wise cracking Rodney Dangerfield of magic. But I never thought that. I want to just be me. I wanna be out on stage and I want people to see exactly who I am. And when I tell a story that they don't think, okay, he's going into performance mode now, it should feel exactly like the stories that we're talking about right now. And I work very hard at that because they are scripts and they are rehearsed but I hope you don't see the line when it happens. I want the illusion to be perfect, but we got a bunch of questions that, that I guess we should try and get through. Um, yes. Jay wants to know, how has the major accident and the lingering effects on your left hand affected the way you perform? Very good question. And I was with Jay Frazier last night. I met Jay Frazier uh, for the first time at the event that I did last night. Good to see you again, Jay. Um, yeah, this is my, I don't know if you can see in the camera. You can see a scar going all the way up my arm. I was in a, a boating accident uh, nine years ago that shattered my seven of the eight bones in my wrist. Uh, I had three surgeries at the Cleveland Clinic. Um, my wrist grew two watch sizes um, from, from all the hardware they put in, a plate, five screws, two pins, and I lost all feeling in this part of my hand. Um, I've had to, you know, when you hold a deck of cards, if I was a lefty, so I in the beginning of my career until nine years ago, I had held and dealt cards like this. I had to totally train myself to do it the other way around as a righty, because this is the hand that typically has all the sleight of hand, you know, going with it. And so, yeah, it's been, it's been a terrible adjustment, but of course I'm so lucky to be alive. I'm so lucky to get it back. And it, it all came back in a sense. So. Do you think you're just as good or better? I mean, <laughs> I, I'll be very disappointed with myself if I'm not as good a magician nine years ago as I am now. Well, I mean, I just meant with sleight of hand. I, I think I probably lost a, a quarter of a step that I'll never quite give it because I still have limited feeling here. The thing, I mean, I saw a video, somebody showed it, posted a video a few days ago and I hadn't seen it in a really, and it was me doing moves that if I can say so, really look great. And, you know, <laughs> things that I still work on and try and maintain, but like they look fantastic, but I'm now doing those moves with like the equivalent of if you sat on your hand for the entirety of this interview and then you'd have like 
some feeling, but not all the feeling. So definitely. All right. Howard wants to know, has amazing Randy been influential in your life as a magician? Um, good question. Amazing Randy was such a sweet man. I met him in Fort Lauderdale. I'll, I'll tell a quick story because somebody's in this room and I don't want to go over our time, but I do want to get the story in that, that I want to talk about. Um, yes, the Amazing Randy was great. And he agreed to meet me when I was a nobody teenage magician for the simple reason that I asked. And that's what the magic fraternity is. He gives back to it. And um, we have a catchphrase in my family. My mom uses it all the time, thanks to James Randy. She came with me to England to perform at this big magic festival and James Randi was booked on the same show as me. So we're all sitting around backstage and he's wearing this hat with a big feather in it and his cane with a skull on the top. And he's sitting there kind of looking cranky like he used to look. And I'm sitting next to him before I go on stage, just asking, trying to absorb all this information. And my mom's there and she grew up watching him on Carson. And, and so we said, James Randi, you're up next. Like, can we get you mic'd? And so he stands up, oh, we better go now. And and she says, good luck, Mr. Randy. And he goes, my dear luck has nothing to do with it. You know, because <laughs> he was so literal. He was such a crank and he was so, um, he was so vehement about luck. You know, he was this great debunker of things. Yes. But he even felt that like this sweet woman saying good luck was is like some kind <laughs> of, you know, religious thing that you can with. Luck has nothing to do. So all the time she's, you know, she got shot down. So she'll, anytime anybody's shot down in my family, my mom will go, my dear luck has nothing to do with it. <laughs> but what I wanted to say is this, there's a guy watching that I saw in the chat go by um, named Ray Hyman. And let me just tell this very brief story because this is about um, Oregon. One of the magicians I'm pleased to talk about in the book is uh, Jerry Andrus. Jerry Andrus would not be known to the public, but if you've ever been fascinated with optical illusions, particularly the one with the spiral that makes your uh, vision go wonky for a few minutes, Jerry Andrus is one of the greatest illusion designers and one of the quirkiest and most important magic inventors of all time. And very quickly, I was uh, on my first tour at 17 years old, and I was through Oregon driving my car. I just got my license. And once again, I called up Jerry Andrews because he's one of the greatest. He's one of my heroes. And he agreed to meet me just because it was the right thing to do. He felt that it was passing on things. And we spent one of the most magical days I've ever had together at his house. He lived in this very quirky, small little house. And I love Jerry Andrews. And Jerry Andrews passed away. And I wrote to his closest friend, Ray Hyman, who was in this room and was commenting in the chat. And I said, hey, you know, I don't know whatever happened with some of Ray's stuff, uh, with some of Jerry's stuff and his old manuscripts and things like that. But I, I really don't want to see them get lost. And I want to, in my book, detail about uh, Jerry. And what showed up at my apartment in New York from Ray was this beautiful box of his complete file of Jerry's stuff, the poetry that he had written, designs for illusions, just a wonderful treasure trove of things. And it really helped me with that chapter in the book. And uh, I miss seeing you last night, Ray. And I'm, I'm just so touched by that gesture. And um, so thank you very much. So awesome. All right, one final question. And then, yeah. uh, and then hopefully you can do something for us here. Yeah. Uh, Greg wants to know, and I think this is sort of leads into uh, a larger question. Uh, Greg wants to know specifically, is there some kind of annual magicians gathering in Oregon, right? Specifically to Portland, which I think you could talk about, but also maybe just as a general way, I think a lot of people don't know how to see real magic, right? Like right. they know how to hire a magician for their kid's birthday party or whatever, but the kind of mag magic you're talking about, wh wh what would you say to people who would say, hey, I'd, I'd love to see some real magic? Yeah, great question. Great question to end on. So first of all, you have just been um, deceived in a, a magic trick of your own. Greg Moreland was also at the event last night and helped organize it. <laughs> Greg Moreland was asking a question because I think what he wants me to say, and I'm happy to say it, is that there is, a, there is one magic conference in Oregon, and it is the Portland Magic Jam, organized not coincidentally by Greg, Greg Moreland. Moreland. What? What? And, um, so you got your plug there. And, and truly, for anybody who loves magic and is a magician, you should check out the Portland Magic Jam. It's a great convention. Um, and you're right. There, the question of, I mean, there's two ways to answer it. So very briefly, um, one of the best things I think that this book, I hope, will do, How Magicians Think, 
is that it will shine a light on the magicians who are not the famous guys that you know about and you've probably already seen. And I list some of my favorite magicians who you've never heard of. And I really, I implore you to seek those magicians out and see their shows when, when you can. You can look them up online and, and see really remarkable magic. The name Juan Tamariz, there's a whole chapter on perhaps the greatest living magician. And you can see old clips of Juan Tamariz from Spain Amazing. and so many others. Um, the other thing I wanna say is, is I really would appreciate if, you know, I, I would have loved to have been at Powell's, but if you do pick up my book, it would be um, so kind because, uh, you know, it's, it's a weird time for books and authors and we can't do events in person all the time, but it would mean the world to me if you picked it up. And if you do like the strange characters of magic and this sort of thing, I just launched a podcast also called How Magicians Think, and there are two episodes out. The one that dropped today is about somebody I talk about in the book named Warner Reich, who was, uh, who was in, at Auschwitz. He was a prisoner at Auschwitz when his bunkmate showed him a card trick and that changed the trajectory of his life and he became a lifelong magician. It's an unbelievable story. You really, you can't overstate how great it is. And the whole thing is this episode's, uh, this week's episode of the podcast. And so I hope you'll check that out. But now- now, yes, let's um, let's end with something a little bit more interesting than, than just talking. So, you know, it's hard over Zoom because if I asked you to pick a card, Joe, you couldn't because you're not there to pick one out and you can't look at it without me also seeing it. But if you think about it, that prov provides us with an amazing opportunity that if I asked you to think of a card, that's pretty great because if you're thinking of a card, I can't influence you. I can't show you the faces of these cards and have you just pick one out. You're just thinking of it. Would you please name the card that you are thinking of? I'm thinking of the six of diamonds. The six of diamonds. Yeah. Now, there comes a time in every profession that I would call the critical moment. So if you're a, a cardiac surgeon that's the moment at the end when you have to reattach the valve because if you don't reattach the valve the patient dies right on the table in basketball it's that moment when there's two seconds left and you've got the ball and you're down one point there's no time to run a play or call time out or pass the ball you're either making the shot or you lose the game we're in the critical moment we have built to this moment and i know you think i'm just distracting you but you notice the cards have been on the table since before you named the card if I fail to find your card, I fail. This is the critical moment. No timeouts left. You said the six of diamonds, yes? Yes. I'm going to cut the card in one place, right there. One cut. I'm putting everything on the line for one cut. How did I do? <laughs> yes. Not bad. Not bad. And there it is. <laughs> Love it. Love it. Um, thank you guys all for, for being here, for watching, for uh, tuning in. It's been a real pleasure. Joe, thanks for taking the time out. It means a lot. This is the greatest. This is the greatest. And, and uh, you know, as someone who loves magic uh, without knowing anything about it beyond, uh, beyond what people tell me, um, get Josh's book. I, I, you know, I, I, I would say that anyway, because Josh is a friend of mine. But if I had never met Josh and I and I saw this book and I picked it up, I would be telling everybody it's 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 so great. If you care a little bit about magic, a lot about magic or nothing at all, you're going to love this book. Oh, thank you. Thanks to both of you, Joshua and Joe, and to everyone viewing. Uh, Joshua did the same trick with me before we went live and got my four of diamonds as well so um or no i think mine was a four of clubs or something uh so thanks everyone for joining us this is joshua's book and i just put it in the chat or actually in the chat right now i just put our youtube channel you can check our youtube channel and you can watch this event again tomorrow or whenever you like tell your friends about it it'll be posting up on our youtube channel probably sometime tomorrow um and then I'm also going to post in the chat one more time a link to How Magicians Think, Joshua's book. Joe's uh, baseball book is out. You can look for it. It's beautiful. Um, this is his book about Houdini that I was looking at during the talk. 
Um, thanks to both of you so much. Such an interesting talk. And thanks to everyone for tuning in. And uh, have a great night. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.